Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Napa BookMind today. My name is Elena. We're so glad to have you with us to celebrate Claire Fuller's fourth novel, Unsettled Ground. Claire is one of Napa BookMind's favorite authors. We have been basically obsessed with her books since the beginning. So we are super, super unbelievably excited to have her with us today. All the way from England, where it's eight hours ahead of us. It's eight in the after, in the evening, noon here. So thank you all for joining us at this slightly funky time for our events. Uh, Claire Fuller was born in Oxfordshire, England in 1967. She has written four novels, Our Endless Number of Days, which won the Desmond Elliott Prize, Swimming Lessons and Bitter Orange, and of course, Unsettled Ground, which congratulations to Claire, has just been shortlisted for the Women's Prize. She has an MA in Creative and Critical Writing from the University of Winchester and lives in Hampshire with her husband and has two adult children. Joining Claire in conversation today is Faith Marino, the author of the debut novel, Cormorant Lake. Her short fiction has won awards and honorable mentions from Glimmer Train, the Moth International Short Story Prize, the Jabberwock Review and Boulevard, in addition to fellowships from Writing by Writers, the Disquiet International Literary Prize and the Martha's Vineyard Creative Writing Institute. She lives in Sacramento with her husband, sons and animal friends. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and let Claire and Faith take it away. Thank you, Elena. So Claire, again, congratulations on being shortlisted for the Women's Prize. That's a big deal. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, so for those who have not gotten a chance to read the book yet, um, I'm going to give a quick overview of what it's about before um, Claire reads. So Unsettled Ground tells the story of a family in a small rural village in England. Uh, 51 year old twins Jeannie and Julius have lived their whole lives with their mother Dot in a dilapidated cottage owned by their neighbor Rawson, united by a shared trauma that prevents them from leaving. When Dot dies unexpected, unexpectedly in the night, Jeannie and Julius find themselves physically and financially unprepared to live on their own. And the story follows them as they struggle to stay together and care for one another. Along the way, they learn that Dot was keeping a lot of secrets, as was much of the community, and now they have to piece together a history they thought they knew. This novel is at once graceful and lyrical and infuriating and devastating as we follow the story. Um, so it was a delight to read, and it was, it was absolutely enraging to read, as I was telling you earlier, Claire. Um, so if you would like to read for us, I think everybody would love to hear it. Yeah, I've just got a short, very short section, um, just a couple of pages. And as uh, Faith explained what well, she explained what the book is about. So just before this bit, I'm not reading from the beginning, I'm kind of reading part way through. Um, so Dot, Jeannie's mother, has died. Um, she is a gardener and she uh, grows vegetables and sells them to Max, who owns the deli in the village. And she has also kind of come to get, got to know Bridget and Stu, who are Dot's friends, so friends of her mother's. You might need to know those things, I don't know. Jeannie is in the garden digging up baby carrots. Max says that his customers like them finger-sized, which Jeannie thinks is a waste of bed space and growing time. When she stands, back aching, she sees someone in the scullery. Since Dot died, she has tried to remember to lock the front door when she is up the garden, but sometimes she forgets. The person isn't Julius. He has gone to Wealdon Farm to help take down a chicken shed. She bends to get a better look to see whether it's Stu or, God forbid, one of the Rawsons. She imagines using the garden fork to pin them to the cottage wall, the tines piercing lime render, wattle and daub. The figure, she can only see the torso through the low cottage window, seems to be moving back and forth as though examining items in the scullery. She takes the garden fork with her, prongs forward, and goes in through the open back door. The person has gone from the scullery and when she gets to the kitchen, a young man is peering up the left staircase. Can I help you? 
Jeannie says in a tone that she hopes will suggest outrage, but not fear. The man jumps and turns at her voice and then takes a step back when he sees the fork pointed at him. It is the same young man whom Bridget cuffed about the head in the waiting room at the surgery a week or so ago. He is wearing different clothes now, a cheap suit, the material shiny and too tight for his muscled frame. Jeannie, he says and smiles, and she realises that it's Bridget and Stu's son, fully grown. His blondish hair gelled sideways and upwards, as though a wind is coming at him from the bottom left. The shape of his head, his chin, his cheekbones make him surprisingly handsome. Did Stu look like this when he was younger? She can't imagine it. She remembers that there was some trouble with drinking on the village green late at night, making a nuisance of himself at home, and Stu kicked him out. Jeannie hasn't seen him for years. Nathan, she lowers the garden fork. What are you doing here? Is your brother home? He licks his full lips. No, Jeannie says, although as soon as the word is out, she thinks she should have pretended Julius was ill in bed or up the garden. There's something about Nathan and his veneer of confidence that makes her uncomfortable. Can I help? He hesitates and then says, I've come to give you a warning of eviction. Pardon me? Nathan leans against the dresser. You're going to be evicted. His smile becomes a grimace with the effort of keeping it going. She almost laughs. Don't be ridiculous. I have to put a notice on the front door on Monday and then you'll have a week. A week? A week for what? Jeannie's voice is rising. She still has hold of the fork and her hands grip it tighter. A week to get out. Nathan crosses one ankle over the other. Thank you, Claire. That was lovely. So that is that is such a that's you know that moment in the novel where you really start to realize that that uh, something is wrong, that something bad is happening. Um, but I want to go back to what you said earlier about Dot being a gardener. So much of this book uh, involved gardening. There's so much gardening in the story. Um, which led me to believe that this book was clearly written by a woman who gardens. So first I want to ask you, do you garden? And if so, what are you growing right now? Well, I, I kind of used to be a gardener. And then since I married my husband, uh, however many years ago, he's kind of taken over the garden, which I'm also kind of happy that, that he's the gardener. And now I just go out into the garden and experience the garden, which is very lovely. But um, in March last year, so we have we don't have a very big garden. We live in the town. It's kind of long and narrow, our garden. And, and we had a raised vegetable bed uh, made out of sleepers. So there was you know, railway sleepers all around the edge and the soils in the middle. And But it wasn't very big. And so we really managed to grow kind of six carrots, and a, and a courgette plant, you know, it was it was that small. Um, so just before lockdown, we decided while everybody else was suddenly growing vegetables, we decided that we would get rid of this raised bed, or maybe I decided and I persuaded my husband that there was no point in having it. Um, and we laid a patio, so, so we kind of have even fewer vegetables now, but we've got herb beds and things. But, um, Kind of in previous houses I was definitely the gardener and uh, you know there's been houses I've moved into where there was just a garage in the back garden no back garden at all and I had the garage taken down and so I designed the back garden and laid it all out and did laid the lawn made the beds did everything and I've also had allotments I don't know if you have allotments in the US is that a thing um, I think in the U.S. it would be a community garden. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that kind of thing. So I've had those when I haven't had enough garden space myself and I've grown, you know, lots and lots of vegetables. So although I'm not really doing it now, I that was one of the things actually I, I didn't really have to research. There was so much research to do in this book, but but not really gardens or vegetables. Um, yeah, I... 
I, it, it all came back to me, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely, I was like, Claire knows what she's doing here. <laughs> Claire's yeah. done this before. Which is funny. I feel like you just told my whole story about my relationship with gardening where I, I feel like, like I always start off strong out of the gate. I'm like, yes, this is the year I'm going to be a gardener. And then I, I get, I get six carrots and then, <laughs> then like real carrots. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, that's right. I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> and th there's a point in the book where um, Jeannie is, or remembering, I can't remember if she's doing it or she's remembering digging up new potatoes. And that is absolutely my memory. So she digs these up and it is like discovering treasure in the earth. Because you put in, you know, one seed potato and then have them, you know, much longer, you, you dig them up and it is like handfuls of these things. And you think, you know, how did that happen under the soil? And it is somehow miraculous and wonderful. And I, now I, just saying it, I kind of think, oh, I wish I had a vegetable garden again. <laughs> so I'm going to be telling my husband, can we dig up the patio, please? <laughs> You know, that, that magic of the garden is so palpable in this story. Um, I, I really loved that, that so much of that, that miracle was, was right there on the page. Um, so that actually brings me into my next question, which is about sort of their homesteading and, you know, after Dot dies, Jeannie continues to homestead and she grows much of their food and she tends the chickens and, and, and they have this very kind of um, self-sustaining system. You know, Julius goes out and he works odd jobs around the village and he makes just enough money to survive, but he can't go very far because he can't, he's not capable of riding in a car for very long. Um, so I was kind of curious about your decision to keep them close to the cottage in this kind of little bubble that they have. It's, it's this very tight knit little insulated bubble that they have. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's Dot who, their mother, their dead mother who, keep, who keeps them there obviously when she's alive. So they are, they are 51 when she dies and, and they, they haven't left home. Um, and I, I guess I'm not quite sure where that came from because I don't plan my writing. I just start writing and see what happens. So I knew that Jeannie was the main character, um, but I was writing to discover, I suppose. But I felt that I wanted to, um, to create some constraints for the twins. So the fact that Julius can't go in, in any kind of vehicle with an engine means that he is never really going to be able to, well, it's gonna be very difficult for him to go very far. Um, and his mother, when, when she was alive, kind of puts a duty of care on him to look after his sister, who is diagnosed or told that she has a, a heart condition and therefore can't do any str anything strenuous. And so she stays in the garden and stays with her mother at home gardening and doesn't go out and get an education, never leaves home, never has any relationships. And really I kind of put those things there also to contain her. You know, after her mother dies and when they discover that there are lots of debts and the cottage isn't really theirs, which they believed that it was, um, if Jeannie could suddenly very easily go and get a job, she's also semi-literate. You know, if she didn't have those constraints and Julius could just go and get, you know, get on a bus and go somewhere and, and get a job or buy a car and drive off, then they're kind of, it feels almost like there would be no novel, you know. So I, ha I wanted to keep them at home and create difficulty for them. For me, that's kind of, although I don't plan my novels, I do have a kind of a shape of a novel in my head. So, you know, you start with uh, what life is like at the moment, you're aiming for some kind of climax. And in each scene, things have to get worse and worse and worse and worse for your characters until the climax. And, you know, then there's a new one and then there's the new reality. Um, so, you know, starting out with these problems for these characters and keeping them at home 
meant that that uh, the scenes that came next are always going to be difficult for these characters and things are going to get much worse for them. So rather than have them start in, in what other people would regard a kind of happy place, I wanted them to have a difficult life already so that I was kind of almost halfway there already to the to the climax. I don't know if that makes sense. It's it's yeah. Yeah, no, Claire, you were so cruel to these characters. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, yeah. reading it and every single time I was like, well, things cannot get any worse. But, oh my God, they just got worse. And it's <laughs> the whole novel every time, every time it's like, well, it cannot get any worse than this. And it just got worse. But actually that brings up uh, the topic of Jeannie's, uh, Jeannie's illiteracy, or I wasn't sure, I, I, I assumed that it was dyslexia. Um, and I mean, that's what it struck me, but then it yeah. kind of me, was that, is that? Well, was, you know, it's never specified and she's never diagnosed with that, but she struggles at school, but because of her, she has rheumatic fever as a child. And so she misses a lot of school. So there is a point where this, where her peer group at school, learn to read and write and she is off at that time and she misses it but she can't really catch up and I think she probably does have dyslexia yeah okay because I you know I was thinking a lot about that while reading this because you know I I was wondering if if that was a choice that you made to sort of create sort of a constraint around her, or if that was really just sort of part of her personality. Cause I think that, you know, something like that, um, I have a lot of dyslexics in my family and that it does, you know, create challenges, but it also, I mean, it is kind of a, I mean, with most learning disorders, there's kind of a unique brain wiring and actually musical ability is one of those things that does tend to come with dyslexia. So I was kind of wondering, is that did you write her this way because this is who you envisioned her as, or was this sort of like an extra constraint that sort of prevented her from leaving home or both, I suppose? I guess, I guess both. I mean, my son is very dyslexic and also very musical. So lots of the music in the novel kind of is inspired by him. Um, and I didn't really think about the dyslexia particularly it wasn't, it wasn't so much a conscious decision. It was, again, kind of tied up with, let's make life really difficult um, for this character. But also you know, the way I write, I, I might write a scene and because I don't really know what's gonna come next or, or what my plan is, because I don't have a plan, I write the, consequence, the consequences of the scene before. So it's kind of a cause and effect way of writing. So if at some point I have decided or I've written a scene where Jeannie has, this, has rheumatic fever, has missed a lot of school, then my thoughts start thinking, I start thinking, um, what are the consequences of that? Well, you know, there are all sorts of consequences. There are all sorts of ways I could have gone with that. But I thought, well, what happens if that means that she can't, read or write very well, that's gonna really limit her choices in life and, and also make her the kind of person she, she was, you know, very kind of uh, stoical, but, but also someone who won't admit and accept help from people, she won't admit that she needs help and won't take it when people offer it. Uh, you know, it all, it all kind of comes together in the mix to, to make the kind of person that she is. I'm so glad that you said that because that actually clarifies that that makes a lot of sense with the choices that Jeannie makes, um, even more so than Julius, I think, with um, sort of her refusal to accept help from people um, or, you know, particularly asking for help. She refuses to ask for help. And, you know, Julius tells her that she's proud. Um, but that actually, that makes a lot of sense if she grew up with dyslexia and that was, you know, this sort of shame for her, then yeah, that would lead her to not want to make herself vulnerable in that way. So I'm really glad that you said that. Um, but on that note, you know, there, the, the, 
the family's philosophy, they, they have such interesting ideas about, you know, their, their place in the world and, and they're so, so insular and they're, they're, you know, they frequently describe one another as proud and their unwillingness to ask for help kind of borders on the pathological. Um, and they're, they're really insistent on living this life of self-reliance that they're kind of physically incapable of doing while they're also, you know, really wary about receiving like public assistance or quote unquote charity. And it struck me at times that this is the kind of like up by your bootstraps thinking that that creates these kinds of problems that allows people to dismiss the needs of others in their communities. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how much responsibility you think that Jeannie and Julius have in sort of their own situation and their, their subsequent undoing. Um, I guess they do have some because they, they make some choices and some of those choices are very poor choices. So, so they could have made different choices, but I don't know, you know, if I, I put myself in Jeannie's head and understood what, um, what she had available to her and what she didn't have available to her, um, I, I kind of felt that if I were her, I might have made those choices. Um, so yes, you know, it would be easy to get on a bus and go to a food bank. Well, it wouldn't be that easy, but you could get on a bus and go to a food bank in the nearest town and say, you know, I need some help. Although in order to do that, you need to have somebody say, you know, uh, certainly in this country, you need a, a doctor or somebody to say, yes, this person needs some help and, and to be referred. And to be referred, then you need to be able to go to that person and explain your situation. It's just so not that simple to say, OK, I'm going to go and open a bank account if I'm Jeannie. Well, there isn't a bank in her town. She doesn't have transport. There's, there's a bus once a day to the nearest town and there might not be a bus back at the right time. And then she has to fill in the forms, you know, and, and to go and say to a stranger, I can't fill in this form, I can't really even sign my name. I think that's very, very difficult. She, she just manages it when she has to go and um, register Dot's death. But that I think is very traumatizing for her to admit to the strangers that, um, she can't do these things and she needs help. Um, but it, I know that some readers kind of are frustrated with her because, you know, she is quite naive, but maybe she's naive because of the way that Dot has brought her up. And should we blame Jeannie for that? Or maybe we should blame her mother. Um, there's, I think there's so many kind of outside issues that she has to deal with. You know, very, very practical ones like the bus service. So there comes a point later in the book where she has to um, have some visits to a hospital and she can't get there. And so finally she does have to accept charity and, and have a lift with somebody. Um, but I think the outside issues that she has to deal with are greater than her kind of stubbornness and her pride to say, I'm not accepting help. I think, I think it's very easy for, and I don't want to make assumptions about who's here and who's listening, but certainly for me, um, you know, white, middle-class, enough money. I certainly never have to worry about where my next meal is coming from and how much food I have in the cupboard. And if I need to get to the shops, I can get there. If I need to get to the bank, I can get there. I think it's very easy to think, oh, Jeannie, just do this, do that. But um, I think some of that comes from a point of the reader being in different circumstances than Jeannie. Yeah, no, I think that um, that you make a really good point about that. And I, I one of the things that I found so interesting about this story was that was that it was written in a way that I could completely understand every choice that Jeannie was making. Everything that she did made complete sense to me. And because, you know, how many of us have been in the situation where we, you know, fall on hard times and then we're like, okay, so now does that mean that I have to give up my Netflix subscription? And, and then can it get worse from there? Do I have to get a roommate? And, 
And then it can just, you know, these, these little things that can erode at your sense of, you know, yourself and your safety and, and things like that. So I can completely understand the choices that she make, even, even as those choices were like infuriating me. <laughs> it's like, Jeannie, for God's sake, just ask her for cash next time. But you know, that, and, and that's sort of a, a later on in the novel. Um, but it, it was, it made a lot of sense. Um, so sort of switching gears a little bit, um, why did you decide to make Jeannie and Julius twins specifically, as opposed to, you know, older, younger sibling? Um, really when I start writing or maybe all the way through the book, I'm, I'm chucking stuff in and seeing if it sticks. And by the end of my first draft, which is perhaps a year and a half later, something's have gone by the wayside uh, or I'll take some things out or I'll just think you know is that useful so the twins was a bit like that somewhere along the line in my research I had um, discovered that twins could be born a very long time apart which I had not realized so Jeannie and Julius I think I'm right but I think uh, it's 20 23 hours or something I think they're born apart something like that um, which I just thought was fascinating that that could actually happen. And so um, Dot is not expecting to have another child. She thinks she's just her son. And then suddenly after the midwife has gone home, a daughter arrives. And I, there was no reason for it at that stage when I first put it on, put it in, except that I was going, wow, that's weird. So, and I do that in lots of the books. So uh, in swimming lessons, it rains fish just because I was thinking, wow, it can rain fish. That's really weird. Um, and I, you know, if I had no reason for it later, I would have taken it out, but actually I kept it in and, and there was quite a good reason. Well, I made a reason for it because I wanted it to stay in there, I suppose. So, so the reason that, that I've kept them as twins was really, you know, maybe it would have worked as, as close siblings, but it felt to me like they were living very similar lives up until they were 51 and Dot died. Um, and, uh, you know, they were both at home. They were both, they, they had gone through lots of experience, similar experiences, you know, with their father's traumatic death and all sorts of things. Um, and then when Dot dies, when they're age 51, it felt like suddenly they split and they wanted different things. And up until that point, you know, Jeannie and Julius could almost finish each other's sentences. They, Jeannie certainly understood what Julius was thinking a lot of the time. They didn't always have to express that to each other. Sometimes they could almost express it. They, they communicated through music, you know, they didn't have to do it um, verbally. But suddenly when Dot dies and everything starts falling apart, they lose, that connection and I just thought having them as twins for the would make that connection much stronger so that when it breaks it's it's much more radical for them um so that was the reason really okay yeah no they they struck me as they were almost like a they were almost like a married couple with their dynamic I mean there there's a, a scene where Jeannie is trying to talk to Julius and he's playing the piano and he, it's, it's, it's so cute. It's almost flirtatious. Like she's trying to talk to him and he's playing and, and the way that you wrote it where he's, you know, he's kind of swaying around and, and it was actually quite adorable. And, and it was almost like, you know, like this cute little marriage scene. Um, but they, they do seem to be this, this whole, they're like two parts of a whole. Um, but there were moments where I was really wondering if, if they had kind of reached a moment where that they couldn't come back from, where it seemed like they were going to go their separate ways and possibly never talk to each other again. Was that ever a possibility in this story? No, actually, no, it wasn't. I always knew that I don't want to give the ending away, but they would always be together. I wanted them always to be together. Um, and Jeannie's overriding desire after they're evicted from the cottage is to get back home. And I don't think it's too much of a spoiler 
to say she does get back home, but you know, kind of at what cost? Um, and so no, they were, in my mind, they were always gonna be together because I think, well, even if they had, even if they had split up, I just can't imagine them ever really leaving this village, going anywhere else, not at 51 when they'd lived in the same house in the same place for so long and they didn't know anything else. I think it would be far too scary for either of them to, to have moved away. So even if they had split, I think they would have kind of almost been, you know, one at either end of the village probably and bumping into each other, I imagine, but that was never in my mind. Interesting. Yeah, no, the, the, the fact that they are 51 years old um, was another thing that I found really interesting that they're, they're at a point in their lives where they should be more, you know, more worldwide. They should have certain experiences, you know, under their belts. And the reading of the story, I kept, I kept finding myself thinking that they were younger than they were just because they had spent their whole lives in this very, you know, small space that was just, you know, this small family space. Um, which, you know, kind of made me think a lot about the choices that Dot made, their mother. Um, so, you know, she kept so many secrets and and I, I don't want to spoil it or give any of them away, but, you know, reading through it, I found myself torn between sympathizing with the choices that Dot made as a mother who she herself went through this extremely traumatic experience um, with losing her husband and then with Jeannie's uh, rheumatic fever as a child. So she went through this trauma, but then I also found myself thinking that she was monstrous for some of the choices that she made. So I'm kind of wondering if you could just tell me how to feel about Dot. How do you see that? <laughs> well, I can tell you how I see Dot, but I've, I'm very much the view, and if anyone's read Swimming Lessons, they'll understand that when books are out being read it's they it's completely up to the reader and books are created by the reader and whatever view a reader has of dot or of anything then that's just as valid as as what what i think about dot um but i can tell you what i think about dot so I just think she's a very complex character and actually she's even more complex because we never really see her on the page apart from the very beginning and, and that's her death. Um, so we only ever hear about her and, and everybody seems to have a slightly different view of her. So she was obviously, as, as lots of us do, able to kind of turn towards people and be a certain kind of person turn towards someone else and be a, a different kind of person so you know the doctor was always saying what a good woman she was um but but what is revealed is that perhaps she she wasn't always a good woman um but also I think she really was of her time and place so she really didn't believe in education she thought it was absolutely fine if Jeannie didn't get an education and was never going to leave home and never have a relationship. She saw Jeannie as being fairly happy and content and not kind of rebelling against that and not wanting something else. So therefore, she don't, I don't think she felt that her lie or the lies she told Jeannie um, actually harmed her. I just, I think she felt she was keeping her safe. She was keeping her close and, and kind of the same with Julius because he still had a home. He was, they were loved, you know, they, they made their music, they had enough food. Obviously when she died, she hadn't kind of set things up properly enough for them to, to carry on in that way. But I guess she didn't really contemplate her death. And so I think, I don't see her as a malicious person. I see her as quite a complex person who told a lie and didn't ever really regret it. Yeah, yeah, no, that was that was how I kept seeing her. It was like, you know, similarly with with Jeannie, where I could understand her choices. I I was I was sort of of the same mind of like, yes, as a mother, I could one hundred percent see myself doing all of these things, being like, I have 
my children. They are going to be in my house where I can watch them and keep them safe and no one will ever come near them or harm them. <laughs> this is the space that I can control. So I could, I could completely see how she would, how she would make that kind of, of logical, you know, connection. Um, and I found it very interesting that so many people in the village knew what was going on with Dot. They, so many other people were aware of, of who Dot was, was and what she was doing before Jeannie and Julius. And it was so fascinating to see them kind of, you know, wake up to gradually realize what their mother's life was actually like. And they just did not know that. Um, so I am curious about how, actually, this is kind of a two-parter question. Um, I would like to know where the idea for this novel came from. And then I was wondering if you could tell us how you write your novels generally, like from the moment that you get the idea to the moment that the book is finished. Yeah, so the idea for this one came really from a particular place. So Jeannie and Julius are evicted from their cottage and at some point, lots of things happen, but at some point they end up in a caravan in the woods. And uh, I think in, a, in the US, the car we call them caravans, but I think for you, they're camper trailers. So they're things that are towed behind a car. And uh, these are quite big in the UK, lots of people have them. And when they are no longer needed or they just become too old and shabby, sometimes they get dumped and left places. And so in the countryside, unfortunately, you can see these um, caravans just kind of left to rot. So my son found one in the woods, not too far from where I live. And he knows that I like weird places. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, oh, I found this caravan in the woods, mum, you've got to come and see it. He's nearly 26. Um, and so we went out there and it was really atmospheric. It was a very small caravan, just slept two people. Um, it had obviously once been white, but was now basically green from the leaves and the trees that it was underneath. Um, all the windows had been smashed, had been badly vandalized, the doors hanging off and, and it was very smelly. And whoever had been living there had left lots of stuff, horrible old bedding and just things you just, you know, didn't, you really, really didn't want to touch. But I went in and just looked at it without touching anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really atmospheric place. Um, and it just made me start thinking about who would live there and why. And because there was no running water, there was no power, there was no sanitation, there was no, no there wasn't even a road to it. Um, so what would have taken that person there? What would have been going on in their lives for them to have to live in that place? And after they left, what would their life have been like then? Would, would it have carried on downhill or, or would, would something better have happened to them? Um, so that kind of created the idea of Jeannie in my mind, knowing that at some point I needed to get her to this caravan, but without knowing how or why or who she was, or anything like that. So really, I think I went to see the caravan at the point that I was beginning, I was nearing the end of Bitter Orange. So that's what tends to happen with me. Little ideas come as, as I'm approaching the end of the previous book. And I have to kind of shut them out and think I mustn't start writing because otherwise I won't finish the previous book. So, um, but once Bitter Orange was finished, I don't really give myself any gap. I just kind of I get straight into it. And it's about, for me, I don't think too long about it. I just start writing and, and see what happens and follow the plot in whatever way it seems to want to go. And sometimes it I come to a dead end and I kind of have to backtrack or delete some stuff or whatever. Um, and really that process, of working out the plot and who these people are and what happens to them it takes me about a year and a half to write what might be called the first draft. Although my the way I do it is I have a rule that in every writing session, you know, when I have some time to do some writing, I'm allowed to edit the previous writing session's work 
but then I must write some new words because otherwise I would just love to spend my time editing. I don't know what it's like for you, Faith, but I actually really don't like writing. <laughs> I, I find it really difficult. And what I like is editing or I like having written. I don't like writing, I like having written. Um, so after my year and a half, when I get to the end and I think, oh, so that's what this book is about. It is like a revelation because I have no idea when I'm writing it. And then I probably spend six months or maybe even longer editing and revising and moving stuff around and layering and adding in the clues and the foreshadowing and tightening up characters, you know, doing all that stuff. Even, you know, a high level to begin with and then in finer and finer detail until I'm really looking at every single sentence and then every word in that sentence. Does it flow? Is it the right word? How is it, how does it sound? What's the rhythm like? Um, so that's, yeah, that's my process. Do you identify with any of that? How is it for you? 100%. <laughs> I definitely feel like editing and, and you know, even the revision process feels more productive. I feel like I'm doing something. I'm like, man, I just blasted through 30 pages today. I am on fire. And all I did was, you know, like I just skimmed everything and changed one thing. And I'm like, whew, I got so much done today. <laughs> <laughs> and I think yeah. Lauren Steinem, she's, she said something similar. She said, I don't like writing, but I like having written. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this, this novel is a beautiful tapestry. You can see that there is so much layering, so much intricacy and detail that is so earnest and and you know honest and follows straight through to the end so it was a wonderful wonderful delight to read especially right now with you know things still being kind of murky and not sure if things are reopening or not um it was really nice to curl up with this book and and read about a small rural village in england so thank you so much for writing it um, and Elena, I don't know if you wanted to go ahead and open it up to Q and A's from everyone else. Yeah, so we don't yet have any questions in the chat box. You're more than welcome everybody to put anything in there. Um, I'm going to selfishly start it off because I have had a question that I've been wanting to ask Claire for a while, especially after reading this most recent one. And then if folks uh, want to, after there are any chat box questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, so my question is about mothers. So when I look at the four books that you've written, all of them seem to be sort of outlined and defined by mothers, whether they be absent or present and not great or present and good or, something and i'm really curious on why you think that theme might be so prevalent through your novels i i recognize that it is but it's it's not a plan and and i i want to start by saying i have an actual really good relationship with my mother <laughs> i was just on zoom with her today and having a lovely chat so uh yeah i'm not trying to work something out of my system <laughs> um, and often what i try to do when I start a new book is think what well, I'm I'm not going to do what I did before you know every time I think what well, I want you know if there's lots of timelines I'm not going to do that that was really difficult and also you know in Bitter Orange so the previous book there were two really difficult mothers who who aren't really also on the page but but they informed the two main women in the in the novel so I was thinking, I'm gonna if, I, if there's gonna be a mother in my next novel, she's gonna be lovely. She's gonna really, really love her children. And so actually, I think it's quite interesting what the Faith's question about Dot is that I kind of think she loves Jeannie to such an extent that she actually starts damaging her in that way, rather than being a cruel mother. She loves her so much that she keeps her at home and, and harms her by doing that. So I don't know. So I was thinking in the, well, I'm writing, I'm kind of two thirds of the way through the next novel. So I, I'm thinking maybe I will have no mother at all 
and then I will be able to get around that. Um, but a mother has crept in, but I'm trying to make her just a normal, nice mother. I really don't know why. As someone else once said to me, another bookseller, that apart from nasty mothers or difficult mothers in, in all my novels, I also seem to write about uninhabitable houses, that none of my characters live in a nice place. So um, actually in, in the next novel, they don't live in a nice place either. So I don't know. It's whatever comes out. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing how these two things play out in the next one for sure. Uh, so Laurie is curious what the inspiration for swimming lessons was. Swimming lessons started with a piece of flash fiction. So sometimes I write very, very short stories. And at the time that I was writing, started swimming lessons, I was writing um, flash fiction that was only a hundred words. And it had to be exactly a hundred words and it had to still be a story. It couldn't just be a scene. It still had to have a kind of beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and so, and it was also uh, the flash fiction that I was writing was inspired by photographs. So this was a photograph of a beach, just a kind of normal beach. So I remember writing this hundred word short story of a man walking along the beach and it was about all the things that he found washed up. And um, I, this was another thing I was kind of curious about that he found washed up a trainer, a shoe still with a foot in it. Um, because apparently that is really a, quite a common thing because not to be too gruesome, but if bodies um, fall into the sea, then if they're wearing trainers, often the rest of the body disappears, rots, whatever, but the trainer floats. And so the shoes are washed up with the, sh the feet are washed up with the shoes. Anyway, that got completely written out of, of the novel. There is no trainer with a shoe in it in, in swimming lessons, but that's what started it. So it was a man walking along the beach. I can't remember exactly what happened. It was a hundred word short story, but he, he walked home and that turned into Gil, the main man, I suppose, in swimming lessons. But he is a really difficult character. He's very, very unlikable. And after I'd written about 20,000 words from his point of view, I thought, actually, I really, I really don't like you. And I deleted all but a thousand of them. Um, and then started, but they were still useful because I understand, I understood who this man was. And I was able to write the story then from his wife's point, point of view and from his daughter's point of view. But irritatingly, he, they, they still kind of orbited around him. He was still somehow this central character, despite deleting him. Um, he just, he would kind of wouldn't go away. So that, I guess that was the inspiration for Swimming Lessons. Thank you. Uh, Anne is curious when you started writing, is it something you've always done or something you came to later? I came to it quite late. So I didn't start writing stories and I started writing short stories when I was 40. So 14 years ago, um, I never planned to be a writer. I read and read and read and read for all of those 40 years. Um, and still read now, you know, a couple of couple of books a week, maybe put them on my Instagram page and books at breakfast. So you can kind of see what I read there if you're on Instagram. But um, yeah, I kind of started writing by accident. I never imagined that I would be a writer, but I was looking for a challenge and I found in my local library that there was a, a short story competition and I signed up for that and um, I kind of carried on from there. I had some success with short stories and I decided to do an MA in creative writing and I wrote Our Endless Number Days on that course. And, and I, kinda, I, I sent it off. I understood what the process was for being traditionally published. You, know, you have to get a literary agent first and then hopefully they sell it to a publisher. So I sent it off to agents knowing how difficult it is to get an agent but I got one very quickly and then the book amazingly six weeks later sold to Penguin 
in the UK and sold to Tin House in America and to lots of other publishers around the world. It was just so unexpected and so utterly amazing that I didn't quite know what had hit me really. Um, because I thought, you know, I worked in marketing and I was a sculptor. I didn't really think, oh, I'm going to be a writer now. And then maybe halfway through swimming lessons, I gave up the day job, as they say, and started writing full time. Um, and I still wake up every morning and go, oh, my God, I'm a writer. <laughs> um, yeah. So very, very briefly, that was that's kind of how it worked for me. That's wonderful. Uh, Lori has another question. Uh, when you don't like a character, what motivates you to keep writing that story? And how do these unlikable characters come to be? Well, unless you really hate them, like Gil, you know, I, I, I guess I found him not, I don't mind unlikable characters, but I found, I can't remember why, you know, it was more complex than that for why I deleted him, because sometimes unlikable characters I find uh, as an author are really, really interesting to write. Or you just always want, I think, to write complex characters and nobody is perfect. And and some people are less perfect than others, I guess. Um, and so I'm always happy to keep writing an, a dislikable character because I want to find out why they're like that. So that there's a character, he's not in the book very much, but there's a character called Tom in Unsettled Ground, who's kind of one of the baddies, really. He comes and terrorizes Jeannie when she um, is living in the woods and he does a terrible thing later on. But I didn't want him just to be the bad guy. But although he's not kind of a main character at all, he's very peripheral, I also wanted to have some explanation for who he, who he is and why he's like that. So there's, there's some little comment about how his mother died when he was very young and his father didn't look after him very well. And actually he um, didn't have enough to eat and he used to eat roadkill. Um, so you can kind of imagine the kind of childhood he probably had. It doesn't excuse him, but it might, I hope, give some depth to him. So, so even dislikable characters, I, I, know, I don't delete them. Sometimes if there's too many, I might merge them together. Great, thank, thank you, you Laurie. Good mm -hmm. question. So we just have a couple more minutes left. If anybody wanted to uh, unmute and ask or make a comment or just say hi, now's the time. And Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. <laughs> hi. Oh, I'm so happy to say hi to you in person. Ish. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I it it's a couple a two parter thing. Um, the first one it's not so much a question as a comment. Sort of kind of going with what Elena asked about about mothers. Um, I really. I think I, I loved the way in all of the books that you've given such complexity to mothers. Being a mom myself, I, like there, there's, there always really will feel like there is the way you present yourself to your kids and the way that they know you and the way that maybe you just feel kind of inside and how others see you. And I just, I've always really appreciated that about your writing. Like, even when mothers maybe seem like they were terrible mothers, we don't know what their own stories may have been. And I think when I read Dot, I sort of tried to kind of see her in that light of just, she had this whole other part of herself that she had to keep hidden for her children. And so it, it like, you, like you were saying, it doesn't necessarily excuse, you know, sort of her decisions, but it made me feel like I could come to sort of, sort of understanding of her. Um, and I just, I, I really appreciate that. I think there, there's oftentimes some in writing, it feels like it's very black and white. Like this is just a terrible mother and, and there's nothing that can be said. So I, I, I've always really, really loved that about the writing and especially so in swimming lessons, getting, you know, just this mystery that sort of builds like about who this mother was and where she might be now. Um, and then oh, my, <laughs> My my question too about um, 
was sort of about um, bitter orange um, specifically and just right, I mean, the way that you wrote about that specific kind of place and how, you know, sort of building on the, the uninhabitable houses about these places that people find and end up getting so drawn to and attracted to and creating bonds with places and creating this whole community around, you know, this very tiny space. Is that something that you experience with buildings, with homes? Because I know I, I've heard of people that, that really feel that emotional connection to these very strange but wondrous places. And is that something that you experience yourself? Um, yeah, I think I do. Uh, you know, I, I, I do feel like um, place will make you a certain person. So the kind of place you live in will, will affect your character and you can also affect that place. And, and certainly when I'm writing, um, the kind of sense of place and the place that the character is in is the first thing that comes to me. So, so in Unsettled Ground, it was the character and who lives there. And it was exactly the same for um, Bitter Orange. So it was, um, it's called Linton's in Bitter Orange, but it was actually based on a house that's not too far from me called The Grange um, in Northington. So you could go and look it up if you were interested. Um, and yeah, so, and, and I feel that not necessarily where I live, the house that I live in here, which, you know, is important to me and I you know, care about it and all that kind of stuff, but, but I am in ever so interested in place and I get such a strong feeling of who lived here and what happened, you know, as questions rather than answers when I go to visit a place. It just, they always create so much atmosphere in my head and immediately I start thinking of stories. So the Grange is, is another example. It's, it's um, owned by a charity called um, English Heritage and they look after certain properties in England. Um, and it's a neoclassical house, but all they have done is kind of boarded it up and made it watertight so that you can go and look around the outside and it's a very beautiful house but to go to to see the inside you kind of need special permission and I wrote to them and managed to get a tour and um, all the ceilings are falling down all the plaster is coming off the walls the staircase the, the um, fireplaces have been ripped out under the ceilings are great big nets to catch the plaster as it falls. And this is, you know, like the grandest stately home that you can imagine, but inside it's just crumbling. It's so atmospheric. And the man who took me round um, was the caretaker. And as he took me round, he told me these ghost stories. And those are some of the ghost stories that make it into the book. But he was such a kind of down to earth, blokey workman, and yet, he had been scared in this house. And as we were walking around, I was really kind of getting the shivers. Um, and uh, you can't go around a place like that and not think of stories and characters and who lived here and what happened. So place does really, really affect me in my writing, definitely. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are at just past one o'clock. Uh, Claire or Faith, is there any last thing you want to say before we end for today? No, I well, just thank you so much for looking after us and, you know, maybe one day I can come in real life. It would be lovely. I hope <laughs> oh, we so. Hope so. Thank we you. really hope so. <laughs> and thank you also to Faith for her brilliant interview and for her questions. So I really had a nice time. Great time. Had a wonderful time. Thank you for sending me a free copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Um, Claire's books, all four of her books are available at Napa Bookmine, available online, napabookmine.com or in the shops. Um, we do have signed book plates for Unsettled Ground, so that's very cool as well. And we also have Facebook Cormorant Lake on hand also. Um, so we hope to see both of you in the flesh sometime soon. 
uh, and we hope to see all of you as well. Thank you so much for joining Napa Bookline. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Saturday, no matter what time it is there now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Elena.